welcome to today's lecture before we start our lecture i would like to give a very brief introduction about our institute to our distinguished guest jawaharlal nehru planetarium is engaged in dissemination of science through various programs we have popularization programs aimed towards general public namely sky theater programs which attract about 250000 visitors every year and we have programs like watching of celestial events screening of movies science exhibitions and sky watching uh, attracting people in hundreds we have in depth non formal science education programs starting from school students to undergraduate undergraduate students these students attend classes throughout the year our non formal programs have produced over 110 students who have pursued phd programs and are now involved in research or in teaching we organize public talks in association with research institutes we have had over dozen talks by distinguished scientists in association with icts during this year earlier we had lecture by professor jocelyn bell titled universe and us thanks to the initiative of indian institute of astrophysics several senior scientists from iaa have given lectures to public here dr p shri kumar professor jayant murthy professor g c anupama to name a few iaa have been integral part of our program our educational program reap research education advancement program professor arun mangalam and professor jayant murthy have been teaching in this program since a long time many of our students have pursued phd programs in iaa some under professor k n nagendra who is here today we have this lecture by distinguished scientist professor patrick michael i thank Pro professor nagendra and dr sampurna of iaa for coordinating and making this happen dr patrick michael is an international expert on asteroids he is senior researcher at french scientific national center he is the lead scientist in the international team doing its first test in deflection of potentially hazardous asteroids he is co-investigator of two space missions osiris rex and hayabusa 2 which are designed to bring back asteroid samples he is very active in outreach programs and has written in popular journals on small celestial body hazards space missions and planetary formation he is the recipient of several prestigious awards such as young researcher prize from french society of astronomy and astrophysics in 2006 carl sagan medal for american astronomic from Amer from the american astronomical society paulo farnella international award international astronomical union has honored dr patrick michael by naming an asteroid after him i extend a very warm very warm welcome to you sir i extend hearty welcome to distinguished members in the audience dr k n nagendra dr sampurna and others i extend warm welcome to all the guests so what i'm going to talk to you about uh, asteroids what we know about them why we study them and how to protect us from an impact but before that i'm going to just uh, tell you that i come from uh, nice which is uh, located in the south of france and i work in the observatory called observatoire de la cote d'azur cote d'azur observatory and uh, it was uh, made actually by eiffel who also made the eiffel tower in paris the dome in particular Uh, and you can see the view uh, from my office with the uh, Nice airport and the and the ocean. So I'm leading there the group of planetology. So it's a group basically that tries to understand how the solar system formed, how planets are formed, and uh, how also the other uh, extrasolar systems are evolving and are formed. So the main focus is, of course, to understand how life was brought on Earth, for instance how the giant planets and the terrestrial planets form, why we have a so great diversity of uh, planetary systems in the universe, etc., etc. And uh, personally, in order to, uh, to tackle this problem, uh, I study small bodies. 
And I will tell you why. By studying uh, small bodies and asteroids, we can uh, possibly understand uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, problems of uh, why planets were formed. So first, we have to go back to 4.5, 6, 7 years ago. Our solar system was made of a disk around the sun, made essentially of gas and dust. And in this disk, the dust started to accumulate, uh, to agglomerate and form planetesimals, one kilometer size, 200 kilometer size. And some of them even grow to planetary embryos, a moon or Mars size. And uh, for the lucky ones, they eventually form planets. And uh, for the theorists, the main challenge is to understand how we go from a disk of dust and gas to a planetary system which contains uh, rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, uh, Earth, and Mars, and uh, uh, at further distances, uh, giant planets essentially made of uh, gas or ice. And this is uh, really the main challenge. And uh, in particular, we have some constraints on the time scale. We know that the giant planets form quite rapidly within a million years after the solar system formation. And then the terrestrial planets come later, about tens of million years afterwards. So we have in the calculation to be able to both explain the hierarchy of the planets and also to explain the time scale of their formation. So just to give you a, a sense of the scale we are talking about, so this is uh, uh, Jupiter respect to the Earth, so the Earth is very little. Huh? Uh, I come from Nice, from Nice to Bangalore, it takes about nine hours of flight. And you can see that just a small portion of Jupiter, which is a 300 masses of the Earth. But if I put the Sun now, the Sun contains most of the mass. So here is the Sun, and now Jupiter is here, and, and, and the Earth is here. But this is not the worst thing. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, giant stars, then look at the Sun here, I'm going to put now Arcturus, and then you have Arcturus, and then the Sun is here. And Jupiter is now one pixel. But there is even more. If I put Antares, then Antares is here, and Arcturus is here. And then the Sun is one pixel. So you see that not only you have a hierarchy of planets, big planets, small planets, you have also a hierarchy of stars, very big stars and very small stars. So anyway, the thing is that now we are currently in a solar system which contains eight planets uh, that are shown here. And you have many, many, many small bodies which include both asteroids and comets. Now, I will talk about mostly uh, asteroids today, but just to be complete, I will start further, uh, uh, at further distance from the Sun. And in fact, at very large distance from the Sun, you have what we call comets. So most of them are beyond the orbit of, uh, of Neptune. Uh, in, a, in a belt called, called the Kuiper Belt. It's in French, but it's a Kuiper Belt. And then even further away, at about 50,000 astronomical units from the Sun, so 50,000 times the Earth's distance, uh, the Sun-Earth distance, uh, you have a sort of shell, which is uh, hypothetical, we didn't see it yet, but it's called the Oort Cloud. And this is where you have all these icy bodies, which we call long period comets. So comets that just come once in the solar system. And the reason why they come is that sometimes you have uh, the passage of a star or the galactic tide that shake the shell and, uh, you know, destabilize one of the body and then it comes inside the solar system. And because it is icy, when it comes close to the sun, the ice sublimates, transforms into gas. And this is uh, why you see this coma and the atmosphere of a comet. So the comets are what we call active bodies because when they come con close to the sun, they activate the, 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 the ice transform into gas, and there is an activation, a sort of atmosphere. So these are uh, far from the sun, but then if you come closer to the sun, oh, for, before that, just to show you an image of a comet, of course, this is a comet uh, imaged by Rosetta mission from the European Space Agency, uh, and in particular, we made a spectacular thing, which was to land on the comet. So this is a lander called Philae, which on November 12th, 2014, successfully landed on the comet. So unfortunately, it bounced for one kilometer. We lost it. We knew it was there, but we lost it. We couldn't find it. And it took about a year to eventually find it. But unfortunately, because of that, most of the measurement could not be done. But yet, we have a, a, an orbiter that made a lot of images of this comet, and that showed us how active are these small bodies because they experience uh, you know, thermal processes which are so extreme that uh, during the whole lifetime of the mission we could see changes on the surface. So these are not just passive bodies. 
But now just go back uh, closer to the sun. So now we are between Mars and Jupiter. We have what we call the uh, main asteroid belt. So essentially this is uh, uh, where all the asteroids are. And uh, uh, the reason why they are asteroids and not comets is because in principle, at this distance from the sun, the ice does not survive on the surface. And therefore, they are just rocky body who do not have any activity. Now, of course, it was the classical view, but uh, it has changed recently because we also found some ice in the main belt, and we also found some asteroids which are active. We don't know why. It could be collisions. There is no real uh, robust explanation. But now there is a problem. Do we call them active asteroids or main belt comets? Because uh, <laughs> they are both. So there is now a sort of a change in paradigm. There seems to be a continuum between the two populations, comets and asteroids. But we have to put uh, you know, a frontier, so we decide to, to uh, define asteroids, all bodies that reside within the orbit of Jupiter. And outside, we call them comets. Now, there is also another change. Uh, very recently, we, we found an asteroid which does not even belong to the solar system. You may have heard about uh, Oumuamua, Oumuamua is an interstellar asteroid. It's just a, a crazy rock that came into the solar system, said hello, and then went away. And this is very mysterious for us. This is very mysterious because normally, if you are a dynamicist, you know that it's easier to eject from a planetary system bodies which are at the uh, outside periphery, because this is where you have giant planets, etc. And the bodies which are in the external periphery are icy because it's cold. So when a body comes in the solar system, we expect it to, to become active when it comes close to the sun, like a comet. And this did not happen for this one. So that's why we say it's an asteroid. And this is really still a mystery, how such an asteroid could be possibly ejected from an other, other solar system. We don't have any explanation for that. And moreover, it seems to have an elongation which is a very large. It's like you know, a French baguette. It's, a, it's a, like a cigar very, very elongated. I say it's light because it's based on a light curve which is not clean, but it seems to be very long, so it's a very, very mysterious object. So just to show you the, the diversity of things that we see, uh, we see currently. But let's go back to the asteroid belt. So now this is a top view where you have the Sun, you have the orbit of Mars here, you have the orbit of Jupiter here, and therefore all the green dots are asteroids. So we have about now 750,000 asteroids that are known, of course, there are many more. We estimate that there are one million asteroids larger than one kilometer in size in this belt. The biggest one is a Ceres. It's, uh, uh, it was uh, discovered by Giuseppe Piazzi in Palermo in uh, 1801. And it's about 90, 950 kilometers in size. And it is currently visited by the Dome mission from NASA. Uh, there is about one over 1,000 Earth's mass in this belt. So it's uh, not very large in terms of mass. Uh, and uh, as I always say, if I was in Star Wars uh, and Solo in the uh, Millennium Falcon, I would go through the belt without seeing any asteroid. Because in fact, they are very numerous, but the space is very large and very small. So the probability to encounter an asteroid is very, very small, which is fortunate because this is why we can send satellites to visit Jupiter or Saturn without having to, you know, to zigzag. And on the other hand, it's uh, a challenge to reach an asteroid, and we have to use all the knowledge of celestial mechanics to make sure that you reach an asteroid. So it's uh, misleading to see this kind of image because it seems very crowded. It is because they experience collision with each other, but the astronomical time scale. And on the other hand, if we go through, you don't see any. So the other thing which is interesting is that even though this is a very narrow ring, we have a large diversity in composition. You find rocky bodies, so based, made of uh, silicate, olivine, pyroxene. Then you have uh, metallic bodies, which we believe are the remnant of the cores of some uh, planetoid that were destroyed. We have also carbonaceous bodies. This is very interesting, because carbonaceous bodies are rich in organic materials. And uh, the link between organic materials and life is something that we want to study. So, and then there is also ice, as I said, now we discover that some of these bodies contain ice. And water ice plus carbon, that could, uh, there is a big link with life. So one of the key questions is uh, whether asteroids could contribute to the emergence of life on Earth. 
and we'll see later how we want to respond to that. Then there is another population. So the green, one, the green dots are now replaced by yellow dots. We are still between the, the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. But if you could see from where you are, you see that there are some asteroids which, which are evolving on ellipses. They have part of their orbit going into the main belt, but the rest goes very close to the Sun so that they can cross the trajectory of the Earth. And we call them the near-Earth asteroids. So most of them actually come from the main belt. Uh, there is only a, a small fraction that comes from comet. And we estimate that we have about 1,000 near-Earth asteroids larger than one kilometer. One kilometer is a threshold for a catastrophic global you know, event on Earth. An asteroid of one kilometer eating Earth will have global effect on the, on the, on the whole Earth. That's a, that's a kind of threshold. Fortunately, we identified more than 90% of them, and none of them is threatening us uh, over uh, the next century, at, at least. At least. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that later. But, so, the good thing also with uh, these asteroids is that they, they come close enough to the Earth that they are easier to reach uh, uh, for space missions. Some of, the, some of them are even easier to reach than the Moon. So they are very interesting because they come from the main belt, so they are representative of the material which is in the belt, and they are easier to reach. That's why most of the missions that we're going to talk about to get samples are in the near-Earth object population. So how do they come from the, from the uh, asteroid belt, by the way? So in fact, in this belt, uh, asteroids collide with each other. And these collisions generate fragments, and these fragments can be moved in very unstable zones that make them go from a circular orbit to an elongated one. And that's how they, come, they become near-Earth objects. And when they are near-Earth objects, at the end, they either go into the Sun, and actually 60% of the near-Earth asteroids finish their life in the Sun. A small fractions uh, impact the planet, and the others are ejected beyond Jupiter orbit. But meantime, while they die, some other collisions take place in the main belt, generate new fragments, which are again sent in this near-Earth near asteroid population. And this is why we say that this near-Earth asteroid population is a steady-state number, because even though each individual asteroid dies eventually, it is replaced by another one coming from the main belt. So you have a mechanism of a, you know, burst compensating uh, uh, death, and that's how you keep constant this population, and that's how you know that there is a, a regular frequency of impact on the planet. So just this is a cartoon showing you by your co Italian colleagues what happened in the belt. In the belt, you have two asteroids coming together. They generate a family, and we identified these families. We have about 20 asteroid families. And some of the fragments of these families goes into this kind of a perturbation called resonances, which send them to the Earth's orbit. And then when they go to the Earth or go to the Sun, meantime, you have new ones, and therefore you have uh, this uh, generating mechanics. And when they are near us asteroids, of course, their trajectory is highly perturbed by the planets. And therefore, every asteroid has its own trajectory, which highly depends on the perturbation of the planet. So you cannot summarize, unfortunately, I would say, the, uh, as the trajectory of NEAs, as we call them, by one. Every asteroid has its own trajectory, and this is why you, you need to follow them up by observations in order to make sure where they go, because they have a very difficult evolution to follow. It's like in a weather forecast, uh, we can be predictable in the calculation just over 50 to 100 years. Afterward, the numerical errors grow exponentially, and therefore you are not accurate anymore. So in order to to be able to continue the calculation further in time, you need to be able to follow them up from the Earth and to make a more accurate uh, measurement of their position. So that's how we do that. So what I want to say before continuing is that already you can see that uh, we have a very big diversity in terms of composition in the asteroid population. And one very important thing to remember for these bodies is that they are the remnants of the bricks that form the planets. The main belt is just, uh, you know, the remnant of the material that went into the planet from the Earth, Mars, etc. But they have a big advantage with respect to planets, is that planets are big. And therefore, during their history, they experienced a lot of heating. And therefore, the chemical composition has been changed, modified from the origin. Asteroids are small enough that their 
chemical composition did not evolve since they were formed 4.5 billion years ago. So if you want to trace back the solar system history, and if you want to have the right recipe to cook your solar system, you need to start with the right ingredients. And the asteroids give you what are the ingredients that were originally in the solar nebula and that made the planets. The planets lost that. The, the oldest rocks on Earth are much younger than the edge of the solar system. And if you look at meteorites, and there are some here, you can see that you have elements which are dated at 4.567 years ago, the oldest one. So that's why by studying planets, this is the only way, uh, studying asteroids is the only way to trace back the solar system history with reliable information. That's why I call them the DNA of the solar system. And moreover, we, as we know, they also contain crucial elements that possibly cont contributed to the uh, formation of life on Earth because they contain water. And we know now that the property of water on at least some uh, uh, meteorites are the same as the properties of water oceans. So that's uh, already a good sign. And they contain organic materials. And as I will tell you later, the, what we hope from the samples that we will return is to be able to understand whether this organic material has contributed to the emergence of life. And finally, they represent a risk. But as I will show you, uh, we have a way to study it and to, uh, to possibly prevent it. So, all this uh, involves the, a process called collisions. Collisions are a very important process in the, in the solar system history. They play, actually, a fundamental role in all the phases of the solar system history, starting from the formation of planetesimals. Of course, so in order to grow planets, you must have bodies colliding with each other. So at this phase, they don't destroy, they accumulate because the velocities are low enough that they stick together. And then once the planets are formed, here in this era, of course, the attraction between the bodies become higher, so the ve relative velocities increase, and you enter in an era of uh, you know, big events, such, such as the one that formed the Moon, which we believe was formed by the impact of a Mars-sized bodies with the Earth, and the debris uh, went into orbit and reaccumulated and formed the Moon. So this is uh, the a giant uh, impact era. And now we are in an era where we have collisional disruptions. So in the asteroid belt, you have asteroids colliding with each other, generating fragments. On the, um, on the planet, you have craters that are formed. So we are now in this era. And therefore, if you want to really be able to uh, draw a scenario of the solar system e evolution, you really need a good understanding of this process in order to understand how everything was, uh, was built in the solar system. And uh, one of the witness, the best witness of the collisions in the inner solar system is the Moon. As you know, the Moon is made of a lot of craters, and before the Apollo mission, most of the scientists thought it was volcanoes. And then we realized, no, no, these are impact craters. And by dating these craters and by counting them, this is how we, uh, we confirmed that the flux of impactors in the inner solar system has, been, has remained more or less constant over the last four billion years. And this is how I was telling you the nearest object population is a steady state number. Well, this is uh, consistent with the fact that uh, we have a sort of a constant impact flux over the last four billion years. You can only see that on the moon because uh, when you look at the Earth, of course, you have a lot of water, you will see later, a lot of erosion, winds, and therefore all the traces of the impact are erased in time. So you cannot measure the rate of impact over time by looking at craters on the Earth because they are modified and they finally disappear. And this is how we could draw impact frequencies. So for instance, uh, a body of about a few hundred meters in size collide with Earth every 20,000 years. Don't take these numbers as absolute, they change all the time, we have error bars. But on average, this is what happens, an object of one kilometer is every 500,000 years. Uh, and you see the equivalent of energy, huh? a 300, body, 300 meter body colliding with the Earth is equivalent of 50,000 Hiroshima bombs in terms of impact energy. So it's very big energy, but fortunately this is a rare event. So that's a trick, it's a low probability but big effect. And we have traces on Earth. So this is uh, the craters we have on Earth. We have about 190 craters identified on the Earth. Uh, and it's very difficult to identify. Some of them are not even, uh, you cannot see them. We have one in France. We don't see it. But we see uh, traces on the rocks that tell us that there was a big event. 
Uh, there are some other which are more obvious, but of course you have two shots of water and therefore no crater. And you can see that there is no uh, um, preferred uh, impact location, it's totally random. Uh, the one that is uh, suspected to have contributed to the dinosaur extinction is in uh, Six Kulub in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Uh, it's about 180 kilometers inside, but it is deep. It's, you cannot see it again, it's, uh, it's totally uh, hidden. Uh, and that was about 65 million, uh, million years ago. Uh, we have more obvious traces, like the meteor crater that you can visit in Arizona. Uh, it's about uh, 1.2 kilometer in size, 200 meter deep, and it was made by um, a meteorite that was about uh, 30 to 40 meter in size. We, there are still traces of the, I mean, not traces, uh, rem remnants of the meteorite that you can see, it's an iron meteorite uh, at, this, uh, at the museum and other places. Uh, and it was about 60,000 years ago. Then, uh, more recently, we had uh, an explosion over the Siberian forest called the Tunguska. That was in 1908, 30th June, and this is why we made this uh, asteroid day every 13th of June now, it's the anniversary of this event. So that's about a 50-meter asteroid that exploded in the atmosphere, and uh, a pulverized, a shockwave pulverized about 2,000 kilometers square of forest. So you can see that it starts to be a big event. This occurs every 1,000 years on average. And that was the first time that uh, humans uh, could witness uh, such an event, even if there was no, no injury at all, uh, there was nobody on site. But we have seismic data, uh, uh, witness that mm, heard the sound, the luminosity which increased in the sky for a few days. So it was a, it was a big event. And then uh, sometimes it uh, falls on you. Uh, for instance, uh, that's a lucky uh, girl, a student who had a, who had a car. She was selling it, uh, you know, very cheap. And then a meteorite fell on it. And of course, it became more expensive afterwards because uh, a car that caught a meteorite, uh, it's a very interesting meteorite, by the way. Uh, so sometimes you, you are lucky, you can find these meteorites. Uh, and the, the last one that uh, impacted in France, this is a crazy story, it's, uh, uh, it impacted on the roof of a, of a house, and the name of the lady was Mrs. Comet. <laughs> so that's uh, very funny. So uh, more recently, in 2013, you had a, a, a meteor that exploded over the city of Chelyabinsk in, uh, in Russia. And that was the first time that actually uh, people were injured by the explosion of a meteorite. It was filmed by a lot of cameras that they have in their cars in Russia. You will see here, it's about a 15 to 20 meter body that uh, went through the atmosphere and uh, exploded at a very uh, high altitude, fortunately. So there are many, many, many uh, uh, videos of this event uh, that you can find on the, on the web. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, you have to be careful when you take your coffee break, because sometimes uh, something happens very strange. Boom, oula, what happens? And then, of course, uh, human survival makes uh, that when you don't understand what happens, then uh, you go away. <laughs> and uh, you have to be careful to not be behind the door, because uh, that can be a problematic. So, in fact, the reason why there were so many injuries is that uh, the, the shockwave generated a sound, and people went to the windows to see what happened, and then there was, uh, the windows broke, and most of the injuries came from that. And we had about 1,000 people injured by this, by, by this event. And the equivalent of energy was about 35 Hiroshima bombs. This is the meteor Chelyabinsk size compared to the 7047 Boeing, compared to the meteor crater projectile, so it's very small. So, of course, this happens every century, and yet this is the first time it happened over a city. And the reason is simple, and it's fortunate for us. Even though we say we are overpopulated on Earth, it's because we, you know, we populate a region where we can live, basically, where there is water, etc. And therefore, you have a lot of desert on Earth. There are only a few percent of the surface of the Earth where there are humans. So the probability that a very local impact occurs over a populated area is very, very small. So that's something you, you need to remember, is that, of course, it happened. It can happen, it's like, you know, you can win at Lotto. But the probability is very, very, very small. This is why I would say, this kind of event, we cannot really prevent them. Uh, it would be, uh, 
I mean, if we want to make the inventory of objects as small as that, it would be very, very expensive if possible. And not necessarily reasonable, because this is a very, very, very low risk, and at some point you need to put a threshold. But I will come back to that later. But because of that, yet, the European Space Agencies were the first to really uh, uh, devote a group uh, of experts in order to study what kind of space missions we can do in order to uh, study this impact risk and possibly minimize it. And uh, that was a, a committee called the Near Earth Object Mission Advisory Panel Committee, uh, to which I belonged with a, a few colleagues. And we made a report where we proposed that if we want to minimize the risk, the best is to make a test of deflection of an asteroid. Because if we have a technique that is validated to deflect from its trajectory an asteroid, then at least we have a way to prevent a, a catastrophe. And that was uh, this mission, now called AIDA, that was at the epoch called Don Quixote, but then uh, we moved on to another one that was proposed, and I will come back to this uh, mission a little later. But before going to that, and by the way, this is also why uh, this uh, asteroid day was initiated by Greg Richter, a filmmaker, and Brian May, which is a guitarist of the Queen uh, uh, rock group, and he's also uh, an astrophysicist. He studied the zodiacal, zodiacal dust, uh, and uh, they started this in order to uh, educate people about asteroids, about the risk, about uh, don't go to the window when you hear a shock, and also it enlarged to educate people about also the good things about asteroids. The fact that they tell us about our solar system history, they may have brought the elements to uh, make life emerge on Earth, etc. So it's, a, it's a sort of, it's a positive message. is to say, okay, asteroids are fascinating, and respect to the risk, we have an opportunity to do something about it. And every year, including here, we have events uh, on the 30th of June in order to, uh, you know, hopefully uh, communicate our passion for these uh, little rocks. So now, what is the problem when we study asteroids? So asteroids, we don't, we don't know much from the ground. And the reason is that uh, they are very faint in the sky. They move compared to the sky, to the, to the star. That's why we can identify them. But they are very faint. So the knowledge you can have from ground-based observations remain crucial because you can do that every day, but very limited. So in summary, you can get an estimate of the size, but you don't have a direct observation of the size. You have the luminosity, and from the luminosity, you can estimate the size. Then you can have an, an idea of the shape by looking at how the light curve evolves, but again, it's not a direct estimate. You can measure the rotation, yes. We know that um, on average, asteroids rot rotate over six hours. Remember, the Earth is 24 hours, asteroids six hours, but some of them rotate in less than one minute. They are really super fast rotators, and we need to understand that. Hello. And then uh, uh, we, you can do composition by spectroscopy. So in, if you want to simplify, you look at in which wavelengths the asteroids uh, re-emit the light, and you compare with Earth's elements, and then you can say, okay, this one has a pyroxene, olivine, or carbon, or water, etc. But this is also very, very limited. Because, uh, of course, the light is reflected from the first micrometers of the surface. So you don't have any information about the inside composition. And also about the heterogeneity, because your asteroid in the sky is just a single, single dot. So you just have the average of everything. So you don't have a sense of heterogeneity. But yet, this is the best you can do, and it's already something. Then, if you are lucky and it comes close to the Earth, you can do radar observations. And radar techniques allow you to make a shape model, a real shape images. And for instance, here we discovered two moons of this asteroid called Florence. And it has two moons, and this is something you could do only with radar. I have a sense of the morphology, whether it is a sphere, or here this is Tutatis, it's a contact binary. So it's made of two rocks stuck together by their own gravity, something you could not even know born from just uh, optical observations. But in other words, you don't have anything about the detailed surface properties, about the internal structure, and about the detailed composition. So already, with ground-based observation, we have a tremendous uh, uh, science done, and this is how we better understood uh, the diversity, uh, uh, why they are there, etc. But if you want to go further and deeper in the understanding of the solar system formation, this is not enough. 
And this is why we spend money to do space missions. It's because by going there, of course, you have a knowledge that we'd never get from the ground. So we had a, a few missions already that came to, uh, to, to, to visit an asteroid. And we have now, in perspective, a few missions. In particular, two missions that arrive on the asteroid this year, this very year, in 2018. I will talk about it. You will have uh, new images of uh, two new worlds, basically. We have nothing yet, and boom, we'll have new images, so that's going to be fascinating. And then uh, other long-term uh, long projects. I will go through that. So first of all, what we know now from space mission images. So these are the compilation from July 2010. Actually, I was in India at that time. I was at, in Hyderabad for a meeting. When this image came, this is Lutetia. This was the biggest asteroid for which we had an image at this epoch. It's a main belt asteroid. It was uh, by a flyby of the Rosetta mission that was going to visit this comet. It first made a flyby of the biggest asteroid known, uh, Lutetia, 100 kilometers at that time. But you can see here something very striking already, is that uh, asteroids are very diverse in size, in shape, in um, cratering morphologies. It's a very, 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 very diverse. So that tells us something about the collisional history of the main belt. But if I go later in time, that's in December 2011, this is Vesta. This is the second largest asteroid. It's about uh, 530 kilometers in, uh, in diameter. It was uh, orbited by the Dawn mission from NASA for one year, made amazing images. And this is the only asteroid for which we have a strong evidence that it is differentiated, like a planet. It has a solid iron core, a mantle, and a crust, like a planet. It's a small planetoid, if you want. And it has a very big crater that you can see here, as large as the body. Actually, it has two like this. So it suffered major impact, and this is the only asteroid for which we have a direct link to, with some meteorites that we call the HED meteorites. If you have a piece of these meteorites in your hand, you know they come from Vesta. For all other meteorites, we have an idea of what kind of asteroid they come from, but we don't have the right, the, the, the exact parent body. So for this one, we think we have. But then what I want to say is that Lutetia is now here. So this is the one that was originally uh, here. And uh, down here, you have Itokawa, which is only 320 meters in size. So uh, 530 kilometers, think about the distance from a city in India to another one, which is at 530 kilometers. 320 meters, it just may be the, the length of the, from, uh, from here to the, 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 the bottom, I mean, the hand of the observatory. It's nothing. So what's fascinating with asteroids for physicists like me is that uh, it's a, a f very exciting and complicated lab for physicists. Why? Because the gravity condition, the attraction on a body like Vesta is uh, orders of magnitude larger than the gravity condition of Intokawa. If I want to escape from Vesta, I have to go at a few hundred meters per second. So basically, I cannot escape. Itokawa, I just do that, I don't go back. Six centimeters per second uh, of escape speed, or a few, uh, at, at most 10 centimeters per second of escape speed. Which means that even if they have the same, let's say they have the same composition, of course, the surface will behave totally differently on Itokawa than on Vesta, simply because of the different gravitational attraction. And that's uh, very difficult for the intuition, because we are, you know, every our daily life is on Earth with the attraction on the Earth. And we cannot really intuitively understand how things can behave on a very low gravity body. Even though the physics is the same, the way it expresses is very different and sometimes counterintuitive. Now we know that. So that uh, uh, poses a challenge because we cannot you know, guess very well a priori what would be the surface state on Itokawa, for instance. And when you want to design a space mission and get a sample or land, of course, first of all, you don't even know what is the surface state, because as I told you from the ground, you don't have this information. So you have to assume whether it is sand or bare rock, for instance. But even, even if you knew what is the surface state, you have a very poor understanding about how the surface reacts to any external action. Because the way it reacts in the gravity condition of a very small body is totally different than on Earth. So that's why it's a sort of a very, I mean, it's an adventure at uh, Indiana Jones when you go there because you have a lot of uh, things that you don't know. So uh, 
Next, we have Vesta here, and this is now Ceres. Just to show you again, when you go in, uh, in size, huh, this one the biggest, now the biggest asteroid, Ceres, which is also a dwarf planet, that was uh, from the Hubble telescope. So that was a remote observation, not from the Earth, from the space, but still close to the Earth. But now if I show the image uh, sent by Dawn, of course, this is much better. You see the craters, you see bright spots, very, uh, very strange. Things that you need to be there to see. And this is a very uh, spherical, that's why we call it a dwarf planet. It's in a hydrostatic equilibrium. And, uh, and you see this kind of bright spot. And this is very uh, uh, important because we believe that these are salts that may have been uh, released from a liquid ocean which is inside Ceres. And the water vaporizes and then uh, you have this, uh, this salt. So maybe that's one of the models. Ceres contains uh, Earth deep down uh, in, in, uh, below its crust. So that's a very important thing, and it also demonstrates that ice exists in the main belt, which was not something very, very obvious. Then if I go to Mathilde, Mathilde is very interesting, because Mathilde is a 50 kilometer size asteroid that was uh, um, not visited, that was a flyby by the NEAR mission, which was an, a NASA mission that went to visit Eros. And Mathilde was uh, very, very strange. That's why I talked to you about it. It has five craters larger than 20 kilometers on its surface. So it's a very dark body. It's the only carbonaceous asteroid for which we have an image. From far distance, it's just a flyby, 15 minutes. But the, the, the striking thing is that it has, we, you see only one here, another one which is here, there is one behind, five. And in fact, for us, when we, we saw these images, it was impossible. Because to generate such big craters, you need an impact energy that is so big that the body should not survive. It was an, there was an incompatibility between the size of the craters and the size of the object. So we had to go back to our thoughts, um, calculations, to the physics of the impacts, in order to understand how is it possible to have large craters and a small body. And now we had the, an estimate of the bulk density. Its bulk density is just above the water density, so it's very, very porous. So we try to ask ourselves, what happens if I shoot on a body which is very porous? What happens? So we made some models, and then we found that effectively, these are, these are numerical simulations. Uh, here I will impact on a body which is non-porous, uh, made of basalt. And here I will impact on the same body, but which is made on a very porous material, like pumice. You know the pumice stone that floats on, on, on water. And you will see just qualitatively the difference. So this is this case. So you shoot with your projectile. This is a 100 kilometer size body. The colors are the velocities of the ejecta. You see that you break everything. You have fractures. You have a high velocity ejecta. Now the same impact on a porous body. And surprisingly, what happened? You don't break. You compact the material. And you have only a very small fraction that is ejected at high velocity. So what we think happened with uh, Mathilde is that the impact actually compacted the surface. The porosity absorbed a lot of the shock of the impact and crushed all the pores. And this is why we realized that porous bodies are stronger against impact than non-porous bodies, which has a big consequence for the solar system history because the collisional lifetime of an asteroid highly depends on the internal structure. If it is porous, it will survive longer than it is non-porous. And of course, if you want to deflect an asteroid by an impact, then if it is porous, you have to uh, carry more impact energy to make the same deflection. So just to show you that when you do a space mission, just with one image, you can totally revise your understanding of what you thought you, you knew well. So that's why it's really worth going there, because that obliges you to go back to, uh, to your studies, basically. Now let's go to see Itokawa, which is the smallest body we ever visited so far. So Itokawa is uh, was the, the, the um, uh, target of the Hayabusa mission. It's a Japanese mission. Here I am with the, the Hayabusa team, and you see the, the, at scale the, the small satellite Hayabusa. It was a technology demonstration. It was not a science mission per se. The aim was first to demonstrate some technologies in order to do the next uh, a science mission. But of course, 
even though you do technology demonstrations, when you go to an asteroid, because you know to a new world, <laughs> you have a high science return. So that's why that's something good. As long as you go somewhere you never went, even if it's just to, to, to demonstrate some technology, you learn a lot. So you, 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 have a, you kill two birds with one stone, as we say. So this mission was launched in 2003 uh, from Japan. And the, the, it, it carried an um, ion engine. So basically that was the first technology demonstration using electrical propulsion in deep space for about two, three years at the time to reach uh, uh, Itokawa. The second demonstration was uh, gravity assist. So in, instead of going directly to the asteroid, which is very expensive energetically, you first make a first passage around Earth, and this first passage gives you another extra energy, thanks to the gravity, uh, in order to, uh, at small cost, uh, put you on the right trajectory to reach uh, uh, Itokawa. Then the third technology demonstration was autonomous navigation. Because at about 5,000 kilometers, you have to make a, you know, a, a, a model of the shape of the asteroid because we didn't have a, a good model of the shape. And you have to approach carefully because it doesn't have any gravity, so you are not attracted. So you have to guide yourself by knowing where you go. So on board, you do a, a modeling of the, of the shape of the asteroid, and then you can do uh, autonomous navigation. Then, the, uh, the um, uh, satellite did not go into orbit, it was what we say hovering, so it followed the trajectory of, uh, of this body because it has so low gravity, it's very difficult to go into orbit. It uh, released some markers which allow it to identify places and where it is, and the aim was then to choose a sampling site, to take a sample from the asteroid and come back to Earth. So that's the other demonstration, so there was a little over that was supposed to go on the surface. Unfortunately, they didn't. Nothing uh, always worked perfectly. And this is a sampling mechanism. So the aim was to go very rapidly, five seconds, because you don't want to touch the surface. It's very hot, very scary. So you shoot a little projectile at 300 meters per second. And from the impact of the projectile to the surface, you generate small ejecta. And these small ejecta are captured in a chamber, put in the reentry capsule. And then the next demonstration is to go back to Earth with the reentry capsule and then have the reentry capsule land on Earth, noting that it goes in the atmosphere at a few kilometers per second. So it's a, it's a, it was a big challenge. Now, of course, as always in space mission, nothing works perfectly. There were a lot of issues. It was an adventure, really, like uh, uh, Hollywood movies are, are not as good as that. Uh, but the Japanese fight, and uh, they solved many of the issues. And fortunately, we first arrived there, and this is Itokawa compared to a uh, Tokyo size. So it's a 320 meter average size, but 540 meters in length. Uh, and the big surprise was that, uh, as you can see, it is very rich of boulders uh, uh, and gravel on the surface. And that was a surprise because, as I said, the escape speed is very low. So you don't expect many materials surviving on the surface. In particular, because at that time we thought that most of the granular material that we see on asteroids, we call that regolith on the moon, that we call that now regolith also on asteroids, you know, this dust layer, uh, is generated by the impact. These bodies experience impact, you have ejecta, they come back, and little by little they grow uh, a regolith layer. But the, es the ejection velocity of impact is much larger than the escape velocity of the body. So in principle, when you generate ejecta, nothing or just a very few amount of the ejecta should come back. So how come is it possible that this body has so many gravel, boulders, while uh, first, we don't see many craters, and second, even if there were craters, we don't have any mechanism to make all these ejecta come back. That was the first surprise. And also for the engineers, it was a big problem because you were supposed to land, I mean, to, to take a sample, and you have solar panels that you need to protect. So it was, it was kind of uh, difficult. So this is the approach uh, that was on the 11th of November 2005, the approach of Hayabusa on Itokawa. Uh, you see here the little, uh, yeah, the little circle, the guidance. The asteroid rotates uh, in uh, uh, 12 hours. And you will see the shadow of the spacecraft uh, when we arrive very close to the surface. And this is a, the mechanism uh, that was supposed to shoot a projectile. So here you will see the shadow. It's always amazing to see that because you have to realize we, have, uh, we are 100 million kilometers from the Earth 
and then you see the signature of humans on the asteroid with a, with a shadow. A shadow that is shown here, it looks like the, the vessel of Dark Vader in Empire Strike Back. Uh, and this is our small uh, Hayabusa that was uh, trying to go on the surface. And these are detailed images of the surface. It's really amazing, a very, very small body, and you, you see that uh, it actually looks like what we have on Earth. Huh? But it's a real image from uh, Itokawa. Uh, but you can see how uh, rich in gravel it is, it's not smooth at all, and something we did not expect. Well, the problem is that nothing worked perfectly. Uh, it's a long story, so long, I, don't, I don't have time to tell you all. You can ask me questions after what if you want. But essentially, the projectile was not sh shot, so the sampling mechanism was not activated. However, the spacecraft touched the surface and even bounced, which was not expected. And uh, there was a hope that by bouncing, because there was, uh, the chamber was open, because of the impact, some dust could be trapped into the uh, re-entry capsule. But that was not really sure. But the Japanese, again, persisted, and uh, they saved the spacecraft. It came th three years after what was expected, uh, for at least a reason, was to test the re-entry capsule uh, uh, entry into the atmosphere. For the samples, we didn't know if there was any. And this is actually the re-entry capsule coming on the 13th of June 2010. So here you have the Hayabusa spacecraft, burning in the atmosphere. And then you will see maybe, maybe here, no, you don't see it yet. Here, Oof, a little dot, this little dot close to the red, I remove. This is a re-entry capsule of Hayabusa. After a seven years journey, 2003, 2010, the capsule coming back to Earth safely. And these are colleagues uh, in Australia, Umea Desert, that uh, take the, 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 the capsule back to Japan with a parachute. So that was a, a real success. That was the first return of a spacecraft that went to see an asteroid. And moreover, they found samples. There were 3,000 3, particles micrometer size. And remember that uh, our Earth, uh, the, 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 the width is uh, maybe 30 micron. Mine are even smaller. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very, very small particle, very difficult to identify. But the cosmochemists, as we call them, are genius, and they can do with only very, very tiny material a lot of things, I including counting the craters, which is crazy, or dating the sample, knowing its origin. And uh, this, you can see this kind of material that is used huh, to, uh, to do that. It's a very, very big uh, instrumentation. And it was also a public success in Japan, because uh, there were three movies uh, even one with Watanabe, who played in The Last Samurai uh, with Tom Cruise. They made a movie about the Hayabusa adventure. And if you knew the team of Hayabusa, some of them really looked like the real team. They really took the... So, so that was in Japan a, a big success. The first successful sample return, uh, and with a lot of science return, even though it was a technology demonstration. So that's a, r a real demonstration that w whatever you do, if it's just even for technology demonstration, you have a high science return when you go somewhere new. So that encouraged the agencies to now really go further in the sample return missions. And this is why now we have two sample returns to primitive asteroids. What we call primitive are the carbonaceous asteroids, because we believe that they are the less evolved one. They are formed further away from the sun, they are less heated. And the plan is to bring back samples from these bodies. So we have two missions. One is Hayabusa 2, which is now the, the Hayabusa mission, but uh, science-wise. And we'll visit Ryugu. It's a C-type, carbonaceous asteroid, or B-type, no, C-type. That's a mistake. It's a C-type, carbonaceous asteroid, about 900 meters in size. Uh, this is just a shape model. We don't have an image of this asteroid. Huh? And that's what is fascinating. This is just an assumption. In uh, June 2018, Hayabusa 2 will arrive at this asteroid and will have the real images, new one. We don't have yet any detailed image of a Carmodaceous asteroid. The only image we have is Mathilde, but Mathilde was very far away, big one. So this will be the first images of a Carmodaceous asteroid. Really fascinating. And then we have Bennu, which is uh, the uh, target of Osiris Rex, which is a NASA mission, which will go to uh, visit this asteroid, for which we have at least a radar-shaped model. So it's a... a, a, a more 
educated guess of what it is than for Ryugu, but yet it's just a model. So again, another uh, carbonaceous asteroid for which we'll have uh, real images. So the, the uh, Ayabusatu will arrive in June, July. Uh, Bennu will be approached in August, and the detailed uh, investigation will start uh, end of 2018. So this year is very rich for asteroid science because, of course, we'll have, a, a, we'll have a lot to say. The two teams are communicating together, even overlapping. There is a, a real demonstration that science has no frontiers. We have a lot of geopolitical tension in the world, and yet scientists, they don't care. They work together. Knowledge is universal. And there is really a great atmosphere in these two missions. They share everything. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely a, a great example that uh, when scientists work together, we don't care about... Uh, political tensions, and uh, we just work for, for knowledge, and that's really great. So uh, the reason why we want to do that is that uh, there are some models, including the Nice model, made in Nice, that uh, uh, suggest that the water was brought by asteroids at the end of the Earth's formation. The dynamics tells us that uh, effectively, at the end of Earth's formation, there were still a lot of materials accumulating to the Earth, and uh, when you do the math, uh, asteroids could have brought the amount of water that explains water ocean. So we are going to verify that with the samples. And moreover, because these asteroids contain also organic material, well, we have this uh, possible scenario that they contribute to the emergence of life on Earth. And by analyzing the samples in the lab, you can, be, you can measure the structural properties of the organic material they contain, something you cannot do remotely or in situ. And therefore, you can really verify whether these properties are compatible with the one we think are at the origin of the emergence of life. I take a lot of caution because we don't really know how life was, uh, is created even when we have all the material. But uh, we hope to make big steps in that. So Hayabusa 2 was launched in uh, December 3, 2014 from an island in Japan. And it's always spectacular to see a launch, of course. Uh, this is an ACE-2 rocket. It's a big rocket that uh, launched Hayabusa 2. There was a lot of people in the public uh, that took a lot of pictures. It's, it's always a... It's always impressive, and uh, I went to the Osiris Rex 1, and here you really feel what the intelligence of man can do when it serves knowledge. It's really, I mean, a noise which is totally crazy. You measure how difficult it is to extract from the Earth. You need a lot of, uh, of energy, and that's really fantastic and scary because everything can happen, and uh, you worked for years for a mission, and in uh, one second, a uh, bad thing can happen. This is uh, taken from a plane. So it's, uh, it's really fantastic, and it, it went v perfectly. It was uh, beautiful. And then in October, we will deploy a lander. So remember Philae and Rosetta on the, for the comet? Well, French, uh, France and Germany have designed a lander that will land in principle in October 2018. I say in principle, depends on the surface state that we'll find in July. And uh, the, this lander is supposed to make in situ measurements of the composition and other properties, so that we can compare the composition measured with the composition returned by the samples, which could be different depending where the lander here com is compared to the sampling site and whether the body is heterogeneous. And that will be very, very, very interesting to, to, to look at. And we are actually modeling this uh, uh, deployment of the lander because, oh, I come back. Yeah, we, we are modeling that because, of course, the bone thing depend on the surface properties and on the gravity. And what we want is that it bounces not too much because otherwise we may lose it. So with a student, we are modeling the physics of this bouncing in order to determine in which conditions the, the lander bounces more or less so that when we are there, we can say, okay, here it will be better than here. We do that in advance. But of course, this is just a model. Again, uh, we have to verify what happened. And then in March 2019, the Japanese will release from Hayabusa 2 a little box, which in principle won't do anything for some time, because you will see this box, once deployed, will uh, approach the asteroid. Meantime, Hayabusa 2 will go behind the asteroid. And the reason for that is that this box will explode in order to give kinetic energy to a projectile of 2 kilograms that will impact at two kilometers per second on the surface. You're going to see spectacular. Yes, and that will be a, that's a, a real impact experiment at a scale that we cannot achieve on Earth and on a real asteroid material. 
And the aim is to form a crater and eventually to get a sample either inside the crater or in the surrounding so that we can get ejecta that come from the deep uh, subsurface of the asteroid. Because the aim would be to compare samples taken from the surface and samples taken from the subsurface and see whether solar radiation could have modified what is on the surface. So of course this is just what is planned. Hopefully everything will work perfectly. But uh, you know, in space missions, uh, we are ready for, for everything. And for OSIRIS-REx, um, they will survey the asteroid for two years. And in 2020, they will get a sample with this mechanism. So on Hayabusa 2, the mechanism is the same as Hayabusa 1. And they hope to have a gram of sample. For OSIRIS-REx, it's a little more challenging. They have a big cylinder that will touch the surface, again, for only five, gram, uh, five seconds. And this is a microgravity experiment. You see the cylinder. It releases some nitrogen gas. And this nitrogen gas will impart some motion to the dust so that the dust can eventually be captured in the sampling tool. And by doing so, depending on the surface state, the baseline is to have 60 grams, so it's big, and you can have up to 1 to 2 kilograms of samples, which is very nice because you have to realize that when we get back samples from a celestial body, we keep two-thirds of the sample in the lab for the next generations, new instrumentations, and only one-third is used for current studies. And this one-third you have to share in multiple labs. Some uh, analyses are destructive, so others you need to replicate. So at the end, it doesn't leave much samples. But as I said, the cosmochemists are able to do a tremendous science with just a tiny samples. So hopefully, with these two missions, two different bodies but carbon aceous, we'll uh, learn, I mean, not hopefully, for sure, we'll learn a lot. It's going to be absolutely fantastic, both during the survey, because we'll have two years of survey with uh, all the properties of the body, uh, s craters, etc., uh, challenging things like landing, uh, impacting, and then the return to Earth. So th the next years are going to be fascinating. And by the way, this is a flyby of Osiris Rex uh, with the Earth for the gravity assays. You see the moon and you see the Earth. And it's uh, always fascinating to see how teeny we are. And I cannot understand why we fight against each other here, because uh, we are in, on the same spaceship. And normally, when you are in a ship in the ocean, you want the team to be perfectly uh, uh, happy together. Otherwise, uh, the, the, the ship uh, sinks. And we are the same, and we are not able to understand that. I mean, it's a little crazy. Uh, anyway, two other missions that will go to asteroids uh, further in time, which are also fascinating, is the Psyche mission. So Psyche is a NASA mission that will uh, orbit a metallic asteroid. This is a very large metallic object that we believe is the remnant of the core of a protoplanet, basically, that was destroyed. So you can imagine a, a metallic stone in space. What can it be? Uh, and natural, not uh, you know, uh, shaped by humans. So that's uh, be fascinating. And then another one will visit Trojan asteroids. Trojan asteroids are the asteroids that share the same orbit as Jupiter. And we still don't really understand where they come from. We have models, of course, including the NIST model, that tell us where come these Trojan asteroids. But they are very far away, so we don't have much information from the ground. So we need to go there. And this uh, mission will fly by many of them. So we'll, have, uh, we'll be able to do statistics. We'll, uh, we'll be able to really understand this population. Uh, and so with Metallic, the Trojan, and the Osiris Rex, and Hayabusa 2, I mean, this is a century for asteroids, for sure. So next is planetary defense. So the, the good thing uh, of asteroids I just said. Now uh, we finish the talk by uh, the bad thing, but it's not so bad. It's the fact that they represent a threat for, for the Earth. And uh, uh, we are studying that. And there are three crucial steps that I'm going to describe quickly. But the main message is that Contrary to all the other natural risks that we have to face on Earth, tsunamis, earthquake, that even during our whole lifetime, we see them happening, uh, this is the least li likely natural hazard, of course. This is the least likely, let's be clear. But it has high consequences when it happens, so we have to study it. And why we should study it also is because this is the only one we could predict and prevent by reasonable and feasible means. So we will never be able to prevent an earthquake. Predict is uh, already very complicated, but prevent is impossible, or a tsunami. For asteroids, you have this advantage that we know now that there is a way 
that we can at least test to prevent an impact to happen. And I think this is our responsibility to do so, because even though we have time, once we know how to do something, it's better to be prepared well in advance, even if it's centrally in advance, because when it happens, it's too late if you are unprepared. So we have time to do so, we don't have to panic, this is not the message, but we know how to do it, and by doing it, we, did also, we do a lot, also a lot of technology demonstration and science. So there are many, many reasons why it's relevant to do it now, and that's why we try to do it. So basically, to predict an impact, you need to increase the inventory, to perform the inventory of all the threatening population. Then, uh, you need to characterize these bodies, because you need to understand, uh, you know, what is... Uh, uh, your enemy huh, in order to fight it and then uh, you need to mitigate meaning uh, to deflect to protect and for this you need to do a uh, test in order to have a verified deflection technique eh? i mean it's like uh, even though we understand very well how uh, planes fly uh, i'm not sure if i tell you you know this plane never fly never flew uh, i'm not sure you would go inside you want first a test well the same even though on paper we have a lot of uh, techniques that are uh, proposed we don't have any verified yet, so that's why it's important to do so. So in terms of, car of uh, uh, inventory, we have about, as I said, 1,000 NEOs larger than one kilometer in size. We have reached more than 90% uh, identification, and that will increase again. And now the target is to, to make the inventory of all the bodies larger than 140 meters in size. Why 140 meters? Well, okay, it could be 100 meters, uh, 150. But it's because we're thinking about the threshold of size for which wherever it, it lands, uh, the, the event will reach a, a popul um, populated area. Smaller than that, if it lands on a desert, it remains on a desert. Larger than that, of course, it, uh, it, uh, it reaches something, uh, a city, etc. So this is a threshold for that. It's, if, if it, even if it uh, impacts on the desert, the, the energy is so large that the event eventually will reach populated areas. And for this, we estimate that there are 20 to 25,000 NEOs, and we know less than 20%. So the next step is effectively to uh, reach the possibility to uh, have 90% uh, uh, of these uh, 140 meter identified, object identified. NASA wanted it to, do, to, to be done by 2020, it won't be done. But it can be done from the, from the ground with uh, the new program that are coming, LSST. It will take maybe 20, 30 years, but okay, it's not an uh, emergency. We have time to discover them. As I said, the probability are in favor of us. Uh, of course, I may be wrong, uh, as in Lotto, you can win, but sincerely, I'm more scared about cars than about asteroids. Uh, but we need to do so, because I, I, as long as we don't know, it's better, better safe than sorry, as we say. Uh, and then, uh, with the current discovery rate, we only have 2% more per year. So that's why I say we hope that the new programs will be able to do it from the ground or from space. We still have NEOCAM, which is a, a space mission studied by NASA, which hopefully will be launched. And this mission can do the inventory in much less time than from the ground. And in addition, it has an infrared component, which allows to have directly the size of the object which would be very interesting. So we'll see what happens, but anyway, what I want to say is that at least the survey is uh, continuing and the inventory is, uh, is performed. And by the way, if you are amateur astronomers, we need you because the follow-up of these asteroids, there is a very, very big contribution of amateurs. So it's not only to discover them, we also need to follow them up, and amateurs are, uh, play a big role in that. Then uh, you need to mitigate. So characterization was with the space mission I talked about. You have to characterize on site. And for the mitigation, you need a deflection test. So there are many deflection tests that are uh, um, proposed. So I don't have time to enumerate all of them. But wha what we are studying is this, uh, what we call kinetic impactor test. So the aim is actually to use an artificial projectile sent at uh, hyper velocity, 10 kilometers per second, uh, on average, 7 to 10 kilometers per second, make an impact, and basically, by doing so, you push the body from its trajectory. That way, you avoid a collision with the Earth. So this mission started as a collaboration between the European Space Agency, ESA, and NASA, where you had two components. One is a projectile called DART, made by NASA, and the other one is an orbiter called AIM, initially, now we call it ERA, which would observe the, the, the outcome of the impact and also characterize the body. The target is a binary asteroid. 
I don't know if you know that, but we have about 15% small asteroids, which are the equivalent of the Earth-Moon system at small scale, binaries. And this is called Didymos. The central body, the equivalent of the Earth, if you want, is about 780 meters in size. And we are looking at the target, the little moon called Didymoon, uh, which is about 160 meters in size. So it orbits around this asteroid. And then what we want to do is to shoot on this little moon in order to deflect its trajectory and perturb its motion around the primary. We are not going to move the object from the, uh, on its trajectory around the sun, because we don't want to, <laughs> to put it on the wrong trajectory. Uh, that's not, not a good test. So in order just to test that we are able to shoot on an asteroid, we choose one where the perturbation does not affect uh, the whole trajectory. It's better. So it's a well thought. And uh, the, this is a, the, the projectile. It's a satellite, basically, with an autonomous navigation system. Uh, 550 kilograms, 7 kilometers per second. And uh, the aim is to arrive uh, close to the asteroid to characterize it characterize the body. We don't have any image of this small moon. We have a, a radar model of this one, but this one, we just know its size with bigger bars. So here again, it will be a first images of a binary asteroid, which is very interesting. Then we will deploy some CubeSats. You know, these CubeSats are these uh, one kilogram, uh, you can even buy uh, on the market uh, a kit to do so, but we will uh, align six of them. And these CubeSats have the advantage that they can come, because they are cheaper, they can come closer to the asteroid and take some images or land, taking risks that you don't want to, to do with the mother spacecraft that you want to keep safe. And that will also be a technology demonstration, uh, inter-satellite link communication, how to communicate the data from the CubeSat to the mother spacecraft that will send them to the Earth. That has not been done in deep space. And then, of course, there will be the impact of the DART projectile, so uh, if uh, the, the European mission is there before, it will go away. And then the projectile will arrive, and here you want to test this deflection uh, kinetic impactor technique uh, by doing so. Seven kilometers per second, it will perform a crater. So basically the, uh, the, the, the motion of the projectile, I would call the momentum of the projectile, will be transferred to the target. And it will be enhanced if you have ejecta going in the, right, in the opposite direction. For those of you who do physics, huh, you have a conservation of momentum. So you add the momentum of the projectile and the momentum of the ejecta in the opposite direction. And that's a transfer to the, orb, to the target. So, which means that the higher the amount of ejecta produced, the bigger the momentum transfer. So if you have a very porous object and there are no ejecta because you just compact the surface, you just give to the target the momentum of the projectile, which is much smaller than if you have ejecta. So that's why the internal structure, the subsurface property of the body have a big influence in the, deflection, uh, in the deflection test. And we need to verify all this. And finally, we want to uh, measure the crater properties because so far, all our understanding of the impact physics rely on numerical modeling, which are verified uh, with impact at laboratory scale. We do impact in the lab with a, a few centimeter size targets. And we know that you cannot scale easily what happened at centimeter size to 100 meter size. So all our modeling is just based on the hope that everything works well, even though we verified everything on only centimeter size. So with this mission, we'll be able to verify our modeling, our understanding of the impact at the right scale, at the actual scale of an asteroid, which is something very important, not only for deflection technique, but also for what I was telling you before about the role of collisions in the solar system history, which rely on this understanding. So basically, why we should explore small bodies, that would be my main message. Uh, as I said, the asteroids and comets are our friends. They kept the record of the original composition of the solar system. They created Earth, contributed. They brought water and minerals, that's at least uh, our assumption for now. They brought the chemical material. Uh, they represent a fascinating, fascinating challenge, as I was uh, telling you. Uh, they killed the dinosaurs, which is, uh, for us, very important. <laughs> and this is probably the least likely natural disaster, but as I said, the only one we can predict and prevent, and I hope to, I convinced you with that. And if there are young people here that want to come into this field, you see that we have uh, space missions and data for the next uh, two decades at least. Uh, so I hope you will join us to try to understand uh, all of this. Thank you very much.
how do you take care of the rotation? Because these asteroids rotate in three different modes. So that rotation speed is very important when you uh, plan these uh, missions, isn't it? This is a, a very, very good question, which uh, I was going to say, I hope you would not ask because I don't have any answer. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, and that's, again, the same thing. Uh, all our understanding of this impact physics, even in the lab, is based on targets which are not rotating. And everything we do, even the parameter that we adjust in the collisional evolution models, etc., rely on this understanding. And I agree with you, it's crazy. They all rotate. And some of them rotate even very fast. And so far, we don't know at all what is the difference in the response to an impact of a rotating body compared to a non-rotating one. So that's a, that's a very difficult problem, and that's why a test will tell us what happens. For this case, rotation is very low, very sm slow. So I don't expect much effect, but we don't know. But it's true that if we have a fast rotator, then there is no, and I, I'm, I'm uh, asking experimentalists to think about a clever way to uh, shoot on a rotating target to try to make a difference, because this is not easy. In the lab, if you want to make a target rotate, if you put something on it to make it rotate, you weaken it. So it's not clear that you don't even affect the strength of the material just by... So there is no easy way to answer that. But it's true, all these bodies rotate, and in principle, if we are consistent, we must uh, account for that in, in our models. But so far, we don't have any, any understanding of that. So it's a very good question. It is predicted that in the year 2028, one of the asteroid Apophis is expected to hit the Earth. And if it misses, then in 2030 it is for sure. Uh, though even your explanation answered most of doubts I had, I still want to ask, uh, on what exactly analysis and significant facts was this prediction made? Okay, so, that's, so it's in 2029, so we have one year more. <laughs> Uh, so Apophis was discovered in 24, uh, 2004, uh, and the first predictions were that it would uh, uh, impact the Earth in 2029. Then, uh, fortunately, and that's why I was saying the importance of having follow-up observations, uh, my colleagues found some observations done in June, that was in December 20, 2004, I remember because I was involved in this thing, it was scary. But uh, in June 2004, there were some uh, uh, pre-observations uh, that were done. And by linking them to December, we found that, okay, the probability for 2029 was uh, decreasing a lot. But it remained a high risk for 2036, for one reason. It's because we knew that, and we know, that Apophis is coming close to us on April 13, Friday, 2029 at less than 36,000 kilometers from the Earth, so below the orbit of the geostationary satellite. And there was an uncertainty of 3,000 kilometers in its trajectory. And within the 3,000 kilometers, there was a hole, we call that a keyhole, of 600 meters. And if it, fa if it flies into this keyhole, in 2036, it uh, collides with the Earth. And we had a probability of first it was 1 over 200, then it decreased 1 over 45,000, then 1 over 200,000, etc. And yet, th there was this uh, possibility for 2036. Now, fortunately, in 2013, there were some radar observations because it came close to the Earth. And the uh, radar observation had the advantage that you can have a, a better astrometry, of, uh, so accurate, more accurate prediction of the position of the asteroid. And then by going, doing again the computation with the more accurate prediction, we checked that it won't go into the keyhole. So it won't impact in 2036. So now the final state is that uh, Apophis will come close to the Earth in 2029. You can even see the light by naked eye. It's going to be a spectacle because it's a 350 meter object. So it's uh, uh, just, just the light, huh? not the, the rock, <laughs> you won't see, but, uh, but at least you will see it. Uh, it will come very, very close, but it won't collide with the Earth. That's removed. And that's essentially what happened most of the time. Uh, and that's why with the media, it's very important, and now they know it, we had to educate them. Because the problem we have is the first observations are always very poor. So when you extrapolate the uh, trajectory accounting for all the possible positions for now, you often have a solution that goes to a, to a collision with the Earth. 
And, and we communicate it. Why we communicate? Because when we find that, we hope that the amateurs, we go to the Minor Planet Center website and say, oh, this object has a high risk, let's observe it, so that will remove the probability. But by communicating, the journalist says, oh, this one has a high probability, ah, oh, blah, 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 we have an impact. And then the next day we say, wait a minute, an amateur observe, there is no impact. Oh, but astronomers are stupid. <laughs> no, it's because we, uh, we have more accuracy. So now the journalists understand that. It's, it was not obvious. I don't blame them. Uh, and, and, the, and the bottom line is that we are very transparent. There is no, often you hear conspiracy. Oh, you know, it's going to, no, no. If we knew that there is a high probability of an impact, we immediately communicate because as long as we are not 100% uh, sure, we want more observations. And uh, we need a global coverage from the Earth, and therefore am amateur astronomers are very useful for that. So far, there is known that has a 100% probability to collide with the Earth, and even known that is really risky. On based on what observations do you conclude if an asteroid has an iron core or a rocky core as, or a hollow as a whole? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we, the only thing we no, I mean, we estimate is when we have a possibility to estimate the density. Okay? Uh, if you have a density which is larger than a rock density, then you can expect that there is some uh, iron inside. Uh, if it has a density which is uh, like a Mathilde 1.3 gram per cubic centimeter, that cannot be iron. There must be void on the contrary. So, the, the, so there are two things. First, the spectroscopic observations that can tell you if the surface is metallic or carbonaceous or silicate, etc. But you were thinking about the internal structure, right? Yeah, for the internal structure, unfortunately, and I'm fighting for that, we don't have any direct measurements. My dream is to have a radar tomographer, you know, like a, a, a radar or a lander with a radar going through the, the, the way go through the, the, the asteroid and you collect the signal behind with a satellite and you do like we do for the body. And then you have the direct measurement. We don't have it, that yet for any asteroids. So everything we do is uh, derived from what we can have. The best we can have so far is the density. If you, but you need to be there. If you have a density of, uh, like Lutetia, the density which is higher that we think is a rock, so we believe it has a, maybe an iron core, it's still under debate. Um, but that's, the, that's all you can do, otherwise, there is no way to... Uh, for Vesta, it's different, because Vesta is a big crater. We know it has a basaltic crust. We have meteorite from it, so we know it's differentiated thanks to that. For the others, it's just a guess derived. So if an uh, Indian agency wants to send a radar tomography on an asteroid, uh, I vote for it. We, we, no, but seriously, we need this information. We hope to have that on the IDA mission. Um, we are still hoping that uh, uh, there will be a radar that can at least probe the subsurface, the few tens of meters, which would be already gold. But if we want platinum, the best would be a radar tomographer. And then you have a direct uh, observation. The deflection technique uh, that you said, uh, as it is predicted now, apostasis is approaching. Now, is there no other deflection technique uh, implemented or is in progress to deviate apophis from the Earth? No, and we don't want to deviate it, because now we know that it misses the Earth. <laughs> it's a two cents. You don't play with these things. You know. <laughs> On the contrary, we choose an object for which we know, as I said, that either we move the trajectory of the moon so that we don't really move the, the center of mass trajectory, if you want, uh, or if we take a single object, we, cho we choose an object for which the minimal distance to the sun we know is going away but we don't choose one which already approach, uh, because we don't really control what we do. Mm. We, I mean, with the kinetic impact or technique, the best you can do is to avoid that it, it um, uh, misears. But how much, you don't know, because there are so many parameters, the internal structure, uh, the rotation, etc. The only uh, deterministic techniques, which is uh, uh, difficult to implement, but it's deterministic, is the gravity tractor. The gravity tractor is just you put a satellite and you use its mass to attract the asteroid and move it from its path. Then it's a Newton law, deterministic. But it's a very, very slow process because you cannot send a very, very big mass. Uh, and it's uh, 
technology demonstration, again, you need to show that you can uh, you know, put a satellite at a fixed distance on the long term on a very irregular body rotating, etc. But if it works, then it's purely deterministic. This is the only one. But it can work only for very small bodies because uh, you cannot send a, a very big mass. But this one would be deterministic. The other ones, it's uh, so many uncertainties that you want to prove you, you are able to deflect, but because you don't know exactly how much, you don't choose a body, which is already a little scary. I have a question regarding the porous asteroids. Uh, so since you talked about how they absorb a lot of energy, uh, how would we, is there any other way that we can think of to deflect such asteroids? Because clearly they uh, it take all the impact. So it won't really change the path trajectory much. Uh, it will change. No, it's, uh, uh, it, you still provide the momentum of the projectile, which is small. So in that case, the best would be if you want to use this technique, either you increase the impact energy so that at some point you release some ejecta. You will have some ejecta if you put more energy. Uh, or you do it so much in advance that even the deflection imparted by the momentum of the projectile is enough to meet the Earth. But again, the understanding of the response of a porous bodies relies on our modeling. Maybe it will be worse or better when we do a test. So for the moment, I, I'm not sure I can uh, respond for sure. That's why I'm, I hope a test will, will happen because it's highly probable we learn a lot and we'll have to refine our modeling. So even what I said for the porous bodies, always, I mean, this is for students. Keep in mind that as long as we do models, models always need to be verified. A model is never true. It is valid until something contradicts it. So for now, the model we do for porous bodies seems to be consistent with what we observe, etc. But to respond precisely to a question like this and quantifying, I would say let's make a test. Although I agree that a porous body will be more challenging to deflect. But let's make a test and let's see whether there is absolutely no ejecta or at least enough that, uh, that it works. Otherwise, we have to, uh, to think about um, another technique, like the gravity tractor if it's very small. I mean, we are starting. Recently, in 2013, like the footage you showed, uh, Chela Bing incident, we had that. So, uh, like you mentioned, we have a lot of deflection techniques. Why was none of these applied for that? Because as we know, there were quite a few casualties there. So if, if something similar happens, like how can we avoid them in the near future? Okay, so f first, uh, if something happens again, uh, it's again most more likely that we won't see it in advance, like this one. They are too, too small. Sometimes, luckily, we do. We had an object uh, of a few meters, 2083, that was of her observed 20 hours before impacting, but it was already too late. So for these kind of bodies, we, have, we cannot do much. But it's okay, because the probability that it happens like this is so small. I mean, if we really, if you want to justify that we take care of that, we should stop using cars. Because we accept a level of risk of scar, which is orders of magnitude higher than the level of risk of these kind of objects. So for this kind of object, I don't think we, and plus deflecting a 17 meter body, it's very, very difficult. Okay, gravity tractor could work, but you have to do it very much in advance and you don't see it much in advance. So I would say, let's not be worried by that. There are many more worries in the world. Uh, this one, uh, this one, no. No, what we want to do again is for bodies for which uh, uh, we think that wherever it, it impacts, uh, it will have casualties. And for this, as I said, there are many techniques, but none that has been verified yet. So we have to test. If something happens now, okay, we will, uh, we will need at least 10 years to prepare a mission and to send in, and it will be a blind test, which is something we don't want to have to face. So that's why I say it's better to be prepared before we need it, so that at least uh, we have a technique and, uh, and I already sleep well, but we can sleep even better. I mean, I don't sleep well, but for other reasons. <laughs> uh, so Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. So they are probably in the uh, asteroids, Mars captured those asteroids. So wouldn't it be much easier to study those asteroids than to send out missions farther away? We do. There is a mission called MMX, which will uh, make a sample return of Phobos. It w I didn't talk about it because uh, 
um, lack of time could deserve a, a talk by itself. It's not clear it's a capture. We don't know. There are two hypotheses for Phobos. So Phobos and Deimos are the two small moons of uh, Mars. But of course, they are a small uh, uh, tens of kilometers in size huh, compared to the moon, uh, which is uh, big, uh, several thousand kilometers in size. So uh, the problem is whether Phobos and Deimos were formed by an impact on Mars, which could have uh, generated ejecta and uh, Ejecta, either the impactor of Mars or both could have been in orbit and formed Phobos and Deimos, or captured. And the answer to, that, to this is not only uh, interesting for understanding the origin of the Moon, it, depending on the origin of the Moon, it tells us something about the uh, solar system dynamics in the early phases. Because this happened at the frontier between the in inner solar system and the outer solar system. So the transportation mechanism, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why it's important to study that. And this is why, effectively, JAXA decided to, uh, to study a mission, which hopefully will be uh, fully accepted next year, to go on, on, on Phobos in 2024 and return samples in 2029, with involvement on the French Space Agency, by the way. So there are, there are studies for, uh, for Phobos. It's fascinating bodies also. Everything is fascinating in the solar system. Um, you were speaking about the interstellar asteroid. Uh, I'm guessing it has a higher than average angular velocity, given what? that the interstellar asteroid. Yeah. So does it have a higher than average angular velocity yeah. given that a collision might have caused it? And what are the existing hypotheses for its origin? Okay, so it has a higher velocity effectively. Huh? It comes uh, perpendicular to, the, to the, the plane of the orbits of the planets. Uh, for its origin, it's, uh, it's a mess. <laughs> it's good, but we don't have any... Okay, there are two things to understand. One is uh, the, the, the shape, if it's real, if it's so elongated. And the other one is the lack of activity, as I was saying in my talk. Uh, we expect, if it comes from another planetary system, that it comes from the external part, because for dynamical reasons, you eject more easily material from the outside parts, which are icy. So it should have activated, and it didn't. So we have to find a scenario where you can eject refractory material, so... Uh, formed in all regions and provide, make this elongation. So some people think about, you know, for instance, the, the collision between two uh, big planets, then uh, fragments uh, melted could, uh, could have this, uh, this shape and ejected and come here. Uh, originally, I was thinking of a tidal encounter, you know, like you encounter a giant planet, if you are torn apart, it makes you elongated, but then how you remain elongated? How do you freeze? For the moment, there is no uh, complete scenario. We have ideas, but uh, there is no complete scenario. I hope there will be another one, because based on what they think, uh, because they observed it, because they have a better detection ratio, etc., they think there may be one every year. Because the problem we have is that we, we miss some information. We have, we have some information, so we know something is happening, but we, we miss more accurate uh, shape, uh, spectroscopy, etc. So, so we need more information. Hopefully there is another one we will uh, verify whether this is a systematic or whether this is just one case. I don't know what it tells us about the outside of the solar system, but it tells us something. But for now, we, we miss some pieces. It's uh, strange. It makes me think a lot, but it's empty. <laughs> we are trying yeah. some modeling also, yeah. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, there are uh, uh, large asteroids, more than one kilometer, and, and many small ones. Um, are the techniques for identifying and tracking uh, the large ones and the small ones uh, similar, or are they different? For deflecting? De yeah, detecting and tracking. Ah, detecting and tracking, no, the same. Small and large uh, is uh, optical observations. Uh, if they are small, you need bigger telescopes. Uh, if they are big, you, you need smaller, but we, there are two ways to, I mean, three. Uh, one is optical observations, uh, telescopes uh, on your backyard or the big ones uh, in Chile or LSST, as I said, which will be implemented uh, in Chile also, which will be really, uh, this one will make breakthroughs. Uh, you have radars, if they come close enough to the Earth, but radar is not really to find the asteroid, it's more to uh, uh, improve the astrometry and have a shape model. And then you have a space missions, space observatories. 
And of course, from space, uh, you have a, a better coverage because from the Earth, you look at the opposition always, so you have a limited fraction of the sky. Uh, and then you don't have the atmosphere. If you can put infrared, you have directly the size. So the best is space, but it's much more expensive. From the Earth, it's just the size of the telescope. And for the moment, we don't have any dedicated program for asteroid detection. These are all, all uh, astrophysics telescopes uh, from which we extract the data and get some, sometimes some time, dedicated time, but there is not a systematic program for, for asteroids. That's why it takes more time. Sir, you mentioned the wood cloud in the beginning. Uh, if you don't have any proof, on what basis was it predicted? Was oh, it uh, no, I said we don't have a, a direct observation, but we have evidence. And the evidence comes from the uh, uh, long period comets. They have to come from somewhere. We know they are also bonded to the solar system, and they have to come from somewhere. So that's why Oort speculated about this reservoir of small bodies. And then, thanks to the dynamicist, and including in Nice, it was found that when you form the planet and they migrate, you eject a lot of material in this place called the Oort cloud. So you have observations that already told you, hmm, there must be a reservoir. And now you even have a calculation that shows that this reservoir exists. Now, how many bodies, uh, what is this border, etc. This is a matter of debate, but it is there. And it it's the same, by the way, it's the same for the copper belt. The copper belt was uh, speculated by Edgeworth and Copper in the 50s, uh, maybe a little earlier, and the first object discovered was in 1992 by uh, Jay Witt and Lou in Hawaii. And it might seem a long shot, but can we, we know the trajectory and the peri periods of many comets. So could we, using the sun's gravity assist, could we land a rover or maybe get a space mission nearby a comet, which could then fall into its gravity, gravitational field, and then it could give us a better view of the wood cloud most probably because they have a very large, very lengthy, <laughs> like... You, you should write a book. <laughs> well, in theory, but in practice, you see how difficult it was to land on uh, the comet of Rosetta, which was a Jupiter family comet. You know, you have two problems. Uh, two. No, you have thousands of yeah. problems. Uh. <laughs> one obvious one is that when you want to reach a body, uh, it's very difficult because uh, uh, y y you need to break to be captured into this orbit. Uh, New Horizon went to Pluto straight and then just flew by. Because if you want to insert in orbit, uh, you need a lot of fuel. That's very, very expensive. And then uh, uh, the other problem you have, uh, so in addition to all the problem of surface state, uh, low gravity activity, uh, your lander, we don't know what happens, communication. You know, if you go to the out cloud, uh, uh, you need a big, big, big antenna to be able to communicate with the Earth. So there are technical issues, and technical issues mean cost, and cost is what drives the space mission proposals. So unfortunately for that, um, it, wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't work. But it's a good idea. So does any asteroid as natural satellites? Yes, 15%. I showed some images. Yeah, any nearby? Nearby, yes. Uh, the one we are targeting for IDA, so this, this uh, asteroid, I can show you very quickly. Well, actually, uh, this one. Oops. So this is uh, the H750 meter object. This is a 130-60 meter object. It will approach the Earth in 2022 at uh, 15 million kilometers, but close enough. So the aim is to make the impact on the small moon, so it's a natural satellite, uh, at this period, because you can even measure the deflection from the radar observation from the ground. That's why we choose that. So we have 15% of asteroids which are, have a natural satellite, and even better, some of them have triple. They have two satellites. So it's a very interesting, very interesting dynamics. You know that uh, something which is crazy when you think about it is that uh, you have all a mobile phone 
uh, you can uh, call your friend, your wife, your children, uh, you know, uh, with a screen. Uh, when we were watching Star Wars, uh, Star Trek, when we were a child, we thought it was science fiction. Now, when it freezes, we complain, and it's a quantum I mean, it's a complex physics, and we know how to do that. But for uh, celestial mechanics, we know how to solve the two-body problem, but not the three-body problem. <laughs> you put three masses, and we don't have any analytical solution. So, of course, we know how to compute, otherwise you couldn't go to send a probe on Jupiter. But there is no analytical solution for the problem itself. And some people are still studying in the lab the three-body problem, trying to understand families of orbits, etc., which seems simple to, uh, you know, to just express. How three masses move around each other can we predict the evolution? No. Can I call my wife while I am in India and she's in France? Yes. <laughs> it seems <that's> strange. 